Greville Morris, production designer. I've been a production designer since 1983. Um, and I am here at Bridport Film Festival from page to screen because I set up and curated and designed and built the exhibition at the Allsop Gallery here. It's amazing. It's a pleasure to get a chance to interview you, Thank Caroline. You. Um, to start off, I'd love to kind of talk about your past and how you kind of got into the business. So um, how did you get into like production design in that industry? Um, I'll try and do a short version. I announced at the age of 12, after seeing A Matter of Life and Death, that I wanted to be a film director. My uh, dad took us to the cinema every week and we saw inappropriate and a wide, wide range of films. I loved them all and, and decided that's what I want to do. There were no film schools when I was, um, when I was young and nowhere like where you are. Um, so I did graphic design at college which was the degree that taught you the most stuff, the most actual physical plastic skills. And then with a plan to go to the Royal College of Art and because that was the only film course, but I didn't like it. It was far too documentary, gritty realism. It was just post-punk um, and I'd had enough of that. I wanted to make Hollywood musicals. And um, so I, my other, I'd been a photographer all the way through college. I, I knew lots of punk bands and... Um, so photography and, and how cameras work and film and lighting were, were, were something I'd, I'd, I'd learned. Um, but I could also sew. And so I opened a clothes shop in Kensington Market mm -hmm. at the height of new romanticness, which was kind of super fantasy, mid just early 80s. And um, a journalist friend kind of rushed into the shop after a couple of years and said, you've got to stop all this clothes nonsense. You've got to stop being a photographer. I have got a job. I've left being a journalist and I've, I'm now doing something and you've got to come and work with me. And he was a producer at MGMM, the biggest music video making company in London at the time. MTV had just kind of happened. Mm -hmm. And so I, I mean, I walked in as an art director on the first music video I worked on. I, I learned some great, I learned how to be on set by being an extra for three months. Mm -hmm. I got on every job I could, music video jobs, uh -huh. and talked to everyone. I talked to the camera operators, I talked to the DPs, I talked to, I talked to the DPs, I talked to Jack Cardiff, who was working, we were shooting on 35 mil, we were using tungsten lights, we were using lights that had been on Hitchcock films. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary time. And that generation sort of older, older technicians and um, uh, crew were just retiring because the year I left college, there were six films made in the UK, six. Two of them were carry on films. So the film industry was absolutely on its knees. It was very unionized and it was just dying. Studios were you know, up for sale, being redeveloped. It's not like now where studios are being built. And, um, and so strangely, the little kind of that sort of that little world of music videos kind of saved it, I think, without, um, oh, and on cue a bell rings. Um, <laughs> yes, that's the truth. And every time a bell rings, uh, Angel gets his wind. How symbolic. <laughs> it was so, so that's how it was, you know, it was a, a mixture of kind of a dream and being in the right place and then bringing all the skills I had, my practical skills, my design skills to to do the first music video and and then you know I would just go up to every production company and say I can do this you know how much did it cost I can do it and and the jobs got bigger and bigger and 800 music videos later I kind of slid into tv commercials and then drama that's amazing that's where I am now wow, that's incredible that's such an inspiring story the way you kind of just built yourself up so naturally and then just like took that leap of faith almost there when your pet, like friend came into the shop Yes. Um. And it's kind of, you know, almost all my contemporaries and, you know, quite a lot of the youngsters that work for me now have come into the art department through lots of different ways. There is no one channel because all the skills, whatever they are, whether they're, you know, carpentry, painting, photography, um, fiddling with things, mending things are all, all useful, all crucial. Wow, that's amazing. Wow, thank you. And if you don't mind me asking, obviously you've done so many music videos, commercials. What was your first film project that you got a chance to like do like a serious production design role on? 
It was a film called E equals MC squared. It had an absolute stellar cast. Mm -hmm. It was a vanity project of a rich young man whose uh -huh. dad had given him a million pounds to make a film. Uh -huh. And he'd written a script about a nuclear physicist um, working on quantum mechanics, the work, the particle wave duality, the work that Einstein was working on when he died. I got a kind of honorary O level in um, quantum <laughs> mechanics from <laughs> Oxford where we shot it. Mm -hmm. and. I had never designed a film. The producer had never produced a film. The director had never directed a film. We had a million pounds and we had Jeremy Piven. We had, I mean, I can't even remember the cast now, but if you look it up, it's, it's absolutely, it was star studded. Yeah. Um, John, um, what's it? West, Dominic West was in it. Oh, wow. um, and you know, everyone was super young and we made it. We came in on time on budget. It was, mediocre in the extreme mm -hmm. the guy who directed it sort of lost interest in being a film director and retrained as a psychotherapist oh, wow. and um but for all of us who worked on it it was the break to say we've done a film now oh, that's amazing that's <laughs> that's such an interesting kind of first film to work on yeah have you, it was. have you heard of anything from kind of that guy who put up the money since has he done any other work or uh, we're friends on social media He's not done anything else in the uh -huh. film industry, but everyone else mm -hmm. I'm still pretty much friends with, very close friends with both the producers uh -huh. and um, obviously my crew, um, who I still know. And, um, and they carried on, well, one of them carried on to be a producer and a writer and, and produced TV commercials and films. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, obviously, as, as we know, you've kept active in the and industry, of course. It, yeah. um, and I mean, your most recent project is obviously here at the festival right now, which is the exhibition on film and memory, the Memento exhibition. Um, would you like to talk more about kind of the inspiration for that exhibition and kind of what inspired you to go with that theme? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I was asked to be on the committee of the film festival. I haven't lived here very long. Mm -hmm. and um, And they kind of said... Well, last year, they had a Spinal Tap moment where they'd um, hired some exhibits that turned out to be literally this big, you know, a metre by half a metre, two of them, in that enormous space. Oh, and um, in a panic, and didn't know that until the exhibits arrived. So it was a, the three-foot Stonehenge, you know, the, yeah. from Spinal Tap. And um, so I said, is there anything, Can somebody suggested me, I think Caroline can help, so I did some collages on the wall using scripts and novels because of the page of script. Very quickly, it was all done on a photocopier. It oh, cost yeah. 25 quid and I painted some speech bubbles on the wall yeah. and that's all I could do. I had 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. So this year, they came to me a little earlier and said, you can have the all sop gallery and 500 pounds and do anything you like. So that's a tiny amount of money. Um, and I... I met someone, it was, it was a kind of chance encounter with someone who said, don't forget to add emotion to the exhibition. I had no idea what I was going to do. Yeah. And when they said that to me, um, it was just someone, you know, who comes to the art center. I was like, yes, memory. It, that was the thing that, that, you know, the film I saw that made me want to be, a, to get into the film industry was a matter of life and death. And it's, and I remember how I felt when I saw it. There's the collective memory of, mm -hmm. as a couple were saying in the exhibition the other day, they walked in and it, instead of instantly reacting to the work, they started a conversation about, do you remember when you can smoke in the cinema? <laughs> and how the light, you know, cigarette smoke in the projector beam was a kind of romantic and atmospheric, you know, thing, part of their past and their youth and what have you. And, um, and so that instantly kind of cemented that it's rather than thinking about how they felt when they saw a film. Um, and then just kind of mentioning films to people, my sort of background research was, was in the pub kind of saying, if I said, you know, can you think of a line from Jaws or what film really affected you? And they were like, I never got in a swimming pool even after seeing Jaws. Oh, wow. and, and so it built up a kind of some, some films that mm. really, straw poll kind of affected people and and then I use some of the films that are 
on at the festival as kind of inspiration to to look at at the past of memory of the period film that they're, they're older quite an old demographic here who might actually sort of remember the interiors and what have you and then I thought well I'm a designer I'll make it look like a film set give a little idea of what it's like to be on set and use the materials of a set as what they are rather than yeah. make them look like something else so it's drapes and flats and well, of course. I mean, I'd like to say, just personally, looking around the exhibition, you've done an absolutely fantastic Thank job. You. I think it's a very striking and beautiful kind of encapsulation of the memories that you make that are linked to films. And um, my personal favourite bit about it is how interactive the whole thing is with kind of like the games that you put in and the typewriter from The Shining and getting to write your favourite quotes and put them on the wall. Um, why did you feel that interactivity was kind of such an important part of the exhibition? Because I think films are kind of interactive in a way. And I didn't want it to be an exhibition that you just kind of looked at and came away from. That, that also is another kind of layer of memory, of putting your memory, your memory becoming a plastic real part of the exhibition by, that's why I had the little film strip postcards printed. Um, yeah. In, and so you, so you kind of own it a bit. Yeah, definitely. Because I almost feel as well, like linking back to the memory, you kind of make the, like the memories that almost are the strongest are those ones that are the most interactive. Yeah. Like with films, like with this exhibition where I'm going to remember very fondly the first time I'd done the putting all of the films together with the objects. I mean, yeah, it was a, an amazing choice and I think it's really kind of paid off. Thank you. It was very difficult to... Choosing the films was very hard mm -hmm. because... There's such a, you know, I knew that there'd be quite a wide demographic coming to the exhibition. I didn't want to exclude anyone. I wanted it to be something for kids, something for super old people and something for everyone in between. And that, that's sort of worked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and obviously this is your most recent project and it's kind of got me wondering, I mean, what's next for Caroline? What's next for kind of your next film projects or gallery exhibitions even? <laughs> well, gallery exhibitions, I'm quite loving having done this. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, you make a film and we do our bit. Yeah. We build our sets, we find locations, we dress them and, you know, yeah. make the backgrounds of the characters and all the things that production design does. And then it goes off and it's edited and the soundtrack's put on and the film, and you're very far away from your work. And even when you watch it, there's, you know, the kind of veil between you and it. And this, to be sat in the corner of an exhibition and see and hear people reacting to one's work directly was actually quite addictive and really mm. fun. And I've just been chatting to people up there who were all excited oh, yeah. about doing the, the game thing that you were talking about, which was Forrest Gump, which was Toy Story. Yeah. And then, but I, my kind of tagline of production design is design as a narrative tool. Mm -hmm. I've always felt very, very strongly that the the visual element of film the the bits that my department is responsible for are are the non-verbal storytelling and and work very closely with the script and with the with the director and with the writer at times to kind of say you know i mean i have there are films i've worked on where the director has come up and said what's my film going to look like because Mutant Chronicles was one of those. Okay. The director and the writer had no idea. Okay. So I had an absolute free run. I did a Jekyll and Hyde that was absolutely, completely free run, yeah. um, which is an amazing feeling. It's yeah. the most creative you can get. But I'm not, I like films rather than TV series. I've just worked on, I worked on The Great and I worked on A Town Called Malice on uh -huh. Sky. and. I didn't really like the drawn outness of a story told over eight episodes. I prefer the discipline of telling a story in 90 minutes or films are getting longer yeah. um, in, a, in 104 pages or 110 pages. So I've been writing and I've written a screenplay which um, I am now trying to, you know, hawk around like everyone who's Everyone has a screenplay in a drawer somewhere, and I'm one of those people. You don't mind me being nosy, it's just me being quite curious. Can I ask what the story is of the screenplay, or is it kind of... It's, a, it's, a, rom -com, it's a reverse rom-com. Uh -huh. It's a new genre. 
Um, it's called 25 Things About You That I Love. And it's a story about, uh, the tagline is, someday my prince will leave. Okay. Um, twist on the uh, Snow White song. Yeah. Um, and it's about a, um, it's set against a village pantomime. Okay. It's set against, so it could be a play, interestingly. Uh -huh. It's mainly two locations, the okay. village hall and the, or the community space and the pub. Yes. Um, and it's about an unlovable young woman who is forced to face her unlovableness. Oh, wow, that sounds By amazing. being loved. Yeah, well, oh, I'm sold. <laughs> I almost wish I was a producer. I mean, I'll give you the money now. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Um, and just to finish this up, I would love to ask, if there was one piece of advice you could give to the new generation of filmmakers going into production design, yeah. um, what would you give them? Uh, hundreds of pieces, but I think one of the most important is to not rely on the worldwide interweb for research. Okay. Collect books, collect magazines, steal them from recycling boxes in posh neighbourhoods on, yep. on rubbish day. Keep keep an archive, keep a morgue of images. Yeah. It's I'm horrified when I see when I revert to to searching the internet for visual reference. How you know you we all know that the algorithm sends us the same things, the things that it thinks we want. Yeah. And there's nothing like skimming through a you know a 1975 Sunday Times supplement or whatever you can find to see the juxtaposition of images and textures and colors that are incredibly inspiring. So my piece of advice, my, if I had one, it's to um, get off the internet when you're doing visual research. The second bit would be what I look for in crew when I'm crewing up is the ability to be interested in anything. Uh -huh. So one day, you know, the day I got the call for E equals MC squared. I was mad about physics. I didn't yeah. even do physics, you know, GCSE. Yeah, yeah. And then when I got Jekyll and Hyde, I was mad about Victorian medicine and uh -huh. and that kind of desire to throw yourself into everything. And that I love people who who come to work for me on whatever level, from the painters to you know junior interns, who can go, yeah, I'm going to get excited by that because in the art department, you never know what's going to get thrown at you. Yeah, I can imagine so well. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and speak with us. My absolute pleasure. You're a very good interviewer. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs>